Welcome to Ridgeway Mennonite Church. I'm glad that you have joined us. The past several weeks, I have been reflecting on what it means to be a member of Ridgeway Mennonite Church since we have not gathered in our sanctuary for the past 11 weeks. Sandy and I stopped by the church building last week, and it felt strange to be there. My big, my big takeaway is that the church is not the building, but rather the members of our congregation. I appreciate being part of this church family where we care for each other and support each other during times of struggle and celebration. Today is Pentecost Sunday, the Sunday when we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit upon Jesus' disciples. Pentecost culminated an uncertain time for the disciples when they were fearful and confused. Today, we are also living in an unusual and uncertain time. Much has changed since the last time we worshiped in our sanctuary at Ridgeway, including a change in roles for many persons in our congregation. This morning, Jim Beachy, one of our new elders, will be sharing a devotional with us. As an opening prayer, please pray with me. Thanks, God, that you are with us at all times. Calm our spirits and help us to face these uncertain times with renewed faith and peace of mind. Thanks, too, for sending your Holy Spirit to be with us always. Amen. Hi. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening whenever you're watching this. Can you tell, kids, I'm sitting outside, and can you tell what the weather is today? It's sunny. It's warm. But what else? Is there anything else? There is occasionally a slight breeze. Now, the wind is not something I can see. I can't see the wind. Have you ever seen the wind? You might think you have seen the wind, but really we just see what the wind does. So how can we tell that there's wind? If I listen closely, I can hear the leaves rustling. And sometimes we can see when the wind moves objects. Can you see the wind blowing my hair a little bit? We can see the leaves moving when the wind is pushing the leaves around. We cannot see the wind itself, but you see the leaves moving. Maybe you can look outside your window and see if there's a breeze. Do you see the wind? Nope. But do you see the wind moving anything? Probably. And sometimes we can make our own wind by blowing, right? Can I see the wind that I'm making? <sighs> Try it, blow, Can see if you can see your breath. <sighs> you can't really see your breath, but if it's moving something, if you're blowing on an object, you can see the object moving with the wind moving it. Let's look over here. There's a dandelion. Maybe some of you have these in your yard. This one is ready to be blown. So you're going to blow it with me? On the count of three, we're going to blow. One, two, three. Did you see? You did not see the wind, but you saw me blow and move these seeds. How else can we tell that there's wind? Sometimes you can feel the wind on your cheek. If you blow on your hand or on your arm, you can feel the wind that you're making, but we can't see the wind. We just see the effects of the wind. So this is going to be a little bit like the Holy Spirit. We cannot see the Holy Spirit, but we can see the effects of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to be talking just a little bit more about that in a minute. So we're talking about the Holy Spirit because this Sunday, or today, if you're watching it on Sunday, is Pentecost Sunday. And that is when the church celebrates the arrival of the Holy Spirit. We just learned that you can't see the Spirit, but you can see how it moves things. The wind moves objects, and the Spirit moves inside of us. The Holy Spirit lives in us. And the Holy Spirit is important because that's what gives us power to shine for Jesus, to do good things and kind acts and to love him. 
it's a little bit like this flashlight. So when I turn on this flashlight here in the dark, what do you think should happen? We'll shine it on these steps. Ready? One, two, three. Uh-oh, the flashlight isn't working. Why isn't this flashlight working? Any ideas? Okay, let's check for the batteries. It's empty inside. Do you have a flashlight at home that works? Oh, you know, actually, I have a battery in here that I should be able to put in here and get it to work. The battery gives this flashlight power. And now let's shine it on the steps. See the light? This, this battery inside the flashlight is just like the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit inside us gives us power, power to shine for Jesus. So if you have a flashlight, I'd like you to take one out at night and shine it around and think about when we shine for Jesus, it's the Holy Spirit that helps us to love others as we love him. Good morning, Ridgeway. It's good to be with you this morning. I'll be reading from John 16, 7 to 15. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive me, what he will make known to you. Today is Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost was a well-known, well-established Jewish feast at the time of Jesus, and that was the day that God chose to send the Holy Spirit onto the followers of Jesus. So Pentecost has also become a Christian celebration in addition to having been a Jewish celebration. Now we as Jesus followers recognize several revelations of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All God, but different revelations of God. And scripture could roughly be divided by those revelations. The Old Testament deals with God the Father, the Gospels with God the Son, and the rest of the New Testament, Acts and the letters, focus on God the Spirit. And we have major Christian holidays that mark those transitions. So Christmas marks the break between the focus of the Old Testament and the coming of God the Son Easter marks the end of the earthly ministry of God the Son, and Pentecost marks the beginning of the work of the Spirit, the church itself. Now, one pastor I read about gave a one to 10 rating on these three Christian celebrations. Now that's loaded, of course, but he did it to make a point. He rated Easter at 10, Pentecost at eight, and Christmas at six. But he said that many of the people in his congregation would rate Easter at 10, okay, that, that's important, Christmas at eight, and Pentecost at three. So maybe we just need to know more about Pentecost. 
Now, the Jews have a bunch of annual feasts, seven throughout the year, and three of them were major. So Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Booths. And two of those were very, very significant in the stories we have about Jesus. That would be Passover and Pentecost. Now, Passover was the Jewish feast of the celebration of the escape from Egypt. And remember that Jesus celebrated Passover with his disciples. A big deal. It was the, the Last Supper in the upper room. And so Jesus was celebrating the Jewish Passover feast. And then Pentecost, it celebrated God's gift of the Ten Commandments to the Israelites. Now, in the centuries between the Ten Commandments and Jesus, it had acquired some other names as well, Feast of Weeks, Feast of Harvest, but it was Pentecost. And the interesting thing is that that Feast of Pentecost was the feast that attracted the most Jews, international Jews, from really all over the, the known world at that time, back to Jerusalem for the feast and the celebration. And this is partially illustrated even in one of Paul's letters to the church, to a church, while he was traveling. He wanted to get back to Jerusalem for Pentecost. He was a Jew. Pentecost is the name is based on a Greek word, Pentecosta, for 50. It's a feast that occurred 50 days, seven weeks times seven days, plus one day after Passover. So the two feast celebrations are linked. Now, Jerusalem. When Jesus was here on earth in human body, the city of Jerusalem was already over a thousand years old. It was the center of Jewish life, the center of Jewish politics, and the center of the current Roman control over all of Palestine. Herod the Great, uh, known as the Great because of his massive, massive building projects, not because of his personality, had built this incredible complex right there in the old city of Jerusalem. It was a Jewish temple as a gift, uh, with a lot of caveats to the Jews, and the Roman Antonia Fortress complex. So that, along with the fact that this was a weekend of all these internationals, it was really a hopping place. Now our record of about what happened on Pentecost uh, the stories we have about the time of Jesus spent here are basically from four sources. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Those are the synoptic gospels, very similar to each other, maybe sourced partly from each other. And John. John was written years later and talks about the divinity of Jesus a whole lot. And John is, is my favorite gospel. So we have four different angles, nuances, on the stories of what was happening during Jesus' ministry, but we only have one main document of what happened in the years immediately after Jesus physically left, and that is the book of Acts. Now, Acts was written by a physician named Luke. In fact, Luke wrote one of the Gospels as well, and he both wrote both documents to someone called Theophilus. It's not a Jewish name, so it would have been a Greek. The reason he wrote it was so that you may know the certainty of things that you've been taught. And since Luke was a physician, he probably had quite a bit more education than the fishermen who were Jesus' followers. He also happened to be the only non-Jewish writer in the whole New Testament. He had a different vocabulary, actually, than the other writers. He uses words that are only used in the book of Luke and Acts in the whole Testament, in the whole New Testament. And so he had kind of a unique angle on this. Okay, this is the background then of what happened there in Jerusalem on Pentecost, 50 days after Passover and 10 days after Jesus had ascended. Now, uh, there had been a whole lot of promises made 
One was in the Old Testament, Joel 2.28, from about 800 B.C. I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Well, in the Old Testament, the spirit was given to people for a particular need when they needed it. But here, Joel states that the Holy Spirit will be given to all. Then, later, uh, John the Baptist announced that he, John, baptized with water. That Jesus would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Another promise was from Jesus himself, as documented in John 16, which was the passage read previous to this. Well, Jesus had been gone 10 days. Not much is documented to have happened or is documented about what happened during those 10 days. Jesus had told them to wait and pray for the coming of power. What was that? They did select another person to take the place of Judas. They wanted 12 disciples, apparently to match the 12 tribes of Israel. So it was morning, but about 120 people, all who were Jesus followers, and it included the 12, they were gathered together in the house. It says house. So you know that Greek yogurt you buy that's oikos yogurt? That's the word for house. So all these people were gathered in the oikos. Good information to know. It was in Jerusalem for sure. Some think that might have been the upper room where Jesus held the Last Supper with his, with his disciples. Others think that my, it might have been like uh, in one of the 50 houses in the temple. Apparently there were large halls there. And these were Jews after all they had access. In any case, they were all to gathered together in one place. Sounds kind of nice, doesn't it, to be gathered together in one place? Actually, there are a couple places in Jerusalem that claim to be the site of the, uh, the historical site of the upper room. In both locations, the current structures were probably built over fourth century structures that may have been built over the actual location. There's some evidence of it. In any case, this house, this location is some physical location there in the old city of Jerusalem. So people were waiting and praying. We know that they were gathered early in the day. Maybe they thought that the day of Pentecost would have some special impact, that that's when this thing would happen. So I'm gonna read from Acts 2 what happened suddenly. A sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And the word for fire here is the same word that John used when he said that Jesus would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Tongues, in this case, refers to languages. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under earth. When they heard this sound, so it wasn't just in the house, but around, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Okay, they're in Jerusalem. Galilee is a backwater, three, three days walk north of there. And here are all of these backwater Galileans speaking all these international languages. And it goes on to list the cities and countries from which all these people are from and from which languages are being spoken. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they had too much wine. Okay, Peter was the impetuous one, but Peter is also now 
the one filled with the Spirit, and he gets up and addresses them. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he goes on to, to quote the Joel passage that I read a minute earlier. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over you to by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And then he goes on to quote David. So Peter, based on either the earlier education he had or being spending three years with Jesus or the power of the Spirit or all combined, was able to be spewing out scripture here that he was using in, in his message here. He says, fellow, fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on this throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor his body see decay, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we, we 11, we 12, are witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has promised from the Father, the promised Holy Spirit, he has received from the Father, the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you see and hear. For David did not send to heaven, and, did, and yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool at your feet. Therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Messiah was a key word to all Jews, from all political persuasions. The Herodians worked with the Romans. The Zealots were the extreme opposite pole, and they were sworn to kill a Roman if they had a chance to get by with it. And then you had the Sadducees, the Pharisees, but all groups were waiting and expecting and hoping for the Messiah to come. And here, Peter declares that Jesus was that Messiah, and he's talking to Jews. And when the people heard this, they said they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter goes on, gives his message, and then those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So that was Pentecost. So what was the result of the coming of the Holy Spirit? What was the result to the 12 disciples, to that early church? You know, what started out as a tiny cell of believers turned into a passionate, bunch of firebrands who laughed at death and burned out their lives to tell their experiences and to follow those teachings that Jesus had given them. The church grew. And what is the impact to us who also have the spirit of Jesus? And it's almost embarrassing to see the passion of that early church. They had one focus. That was church and that was Jesus and, and the church of Jesus. And in the meantime, that church growth has continued and, and the power of Jesus is with us. But when we think of what has happened in the name of Jesus in the centuries since then, the negative things that have happened, we wonder how Jesus could have left his church in the hands of people. Many who name themselves Christians seem to have left out the teachings of Jesus 
and the power of the Holy Spirit from their thinking. So may we as Christians, as Jesus followers, focus on Jesus, on the Holy Spirit, and on his church. And may we, by the power of the Spirit, live out those teachings of Jesus. Amen. So our song of response today is called Spirit of the Living God. Um, it's one of my favorite songs that relates to the Holy Spirit. Um, the line in the chorus that just really sticks out to me is speaking about the Holy Spirit. It changes us. It changes what we see and what we see. Be sure to read the announcements in the bulletin, which is an attachment in the email re you received. It'll have uh, information in there about what's going on in the church and prayer requests for the church as well. Now, as a, as a benediction, I want to read a very traditional benediction uh, that was written by Jude in about 75 AD in a letter that he wrote. It's a beautiful benediction. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. 
to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.